welcome everyone. Uh, welcome, Sandra. I'm so, so happy that you're here. I, I first became aware of your work several years ago. We're in a, a relatively short span of time. About three different people said, you, you need to check out Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith. Of course, you know, I'm a physician too and was had budding interest in speaking and writing. And so I did an internet search and immediately fell in love with your work. <laughs> I took your rest quiz and watched your videos. And, and then um, we actually connected at a speak up conference for Christian communicators. And I took your be your own publisher workshop and had a, a brief one-on-one -on -one with you afterwards. And you know, I've subscribed to your email list. I've been been just watching you from afar and, and cheering you on with all that you're doing and, and this Titus II collective most recently. And, and I most recently uh, have read your book here, Sacred Rest, and I'm just nodding my head with all your <laughs> teaching stories in there. Um, so uh, welcome to you and thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me. It's a it's a joy to hear kind of your, how my journey and your journey have yeah. intersected. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, let me formally introduce you to our listeners. Dr. Sandra Dalton-Smith is a board-certified internal medicine physician, speaker, and author, and her bestseller, Sacred Rest, Recover Your Life, Renew Your Energy, Restore Your Sanity, definitely <laughs> spoke to me. <laughs> um, Let's see. And um, in this book, she uh, shares her insights on seven types of rest, which we're going to get into today, that are needed to optimize productivity, increase overall happiness, overcome burnout, and live your best life. And over 250,000 people have discovered their personal rest deficits using her free assessment at the restquiz.com, including me. <laughs> so welcome, Sandra. I have so many questions for you. It's hard to know where to start. And I just really appreciate your time and being here. So if you want to just share with us, I know you've made kind of a gradual transition out of full-time medical practice or you, and you're still practicing some, um, but largely focusing on your writing and speaking career. I'd, I'd love to just hear how that journey began for you and how it's evolved and and if you want to tie it into how you authored that, uh, the Sacred Rest book. Yeah, so um, so you're right. For the past, um, well, I've been in clinical practice for 20 years. And probably about 10 years into that, um, I burned out. I just got to a place where I had no sense of how to keep up with all of the demands of being a physician, as well as I had new two toddlers at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was like, I was doing good until the kids came. And then it was like, <laughs> I don't have any energy for anything. And so that's really where the book came from. That's it came out of just that period of exhaustion in a career that I loved, um, but and didn't want to give up, but also a career that I knew I couldn't keep sustaining it at the way that I had been doing. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I was working 60, 70 something hours most weeks, yeah. um, no idea of how to recover, you know, from the stressors of that particular job. I thought maybe I just needed more sleep, uh, mm -hmm. got more sleep, you know, made a really concerted effort to get more sleep and still waking up tired every morning. Um, mm -hmm. My background's in biochemistry. So whenever I have a problem, my brain kind of is like, how do I <laughs> break this down into the little bitty pieces so that I can understand it better? And that's really where that whole journey with um, researching rest and what is it and how do we get it? And are there types of rest maybe that we're, I'm not getting? That, that's the reason I'm still tired. So that's where all the backstory from the book came from. And when Sacred Rest, you know, first released in 2017, uh, I released it kind of with the mindset of I'm writing this for Christian mamas who are, you know, mm -hmm. in a similar situation that I am. Um, I did divide it up somewhat in that the first half of the book is very research rich and application and practical tips rich. And the second half is very much a spiritual book. It's, it talks about how Jesus used rest. It talks about, you know, the, the gifts of rest. I had no intention that the book would kind of take a life of its own, but the <laughs> research was so different, I think, than what other people had been saying about rest that, you know, all of a sudden CNN health and, and Ted.com and, you know, Inc and fast company and all of these companies 
started reaching out and sharing about the book and, and, you know, having me on Nike, having me on to talk about <laughs> how does this apply to athletes, <laughs> you know, it just kind of really took a life of its own. And from mm-hmm. that speaking engagements, I was already speaking in Christian circles, but then it was like, okay, now doors are open for all of these corporate type circles. And that's what actually drew me out of medicine. I spent, I was spending so much time um, speaking and traveling and, and interviewing and all of these things. I didn't have time for my medical practice anymore. And I really no. felt a piece about that because I was actually helping so many more people than mm-hmm. I ever could in my medical practice, you know, in a small town. So mm-hmm. it's just been really cool to see the evolution of that. I now actually own a health, um, it's a um, workplace well-being consulting agency. So that's nice. more of my job now. I am the CEO and founding physician of Restoracis. So that's where I spend a lot of my time. And on top of that, as you mentioned, I have some other passion projects like Titus 2 Collaborative and some other things. Mm-hmm. Well, That's what wonderful. a beautiful journey. I love how, how God uses our, our pain and struggles to evolve us and then eventually help others uh, struggling with the same thing. So it's beautiful. Tell us more about the Titus 2 Collaborative that you've launched. What is it? Who do you serve? Yeah. So um, when I first started as I mentioned, my very first book came out in 2011. So Sacred Rest was 2017. When my very first book released, I was anti-speaking. I, you know, didn't have a platform. I didn't know anything about anything. I just knew that I had a a passion about that particular topic. It was set free to live free, breaking through the seven lies women tell themselves. Mm -hmm. So when I got initially introduced to the whole, okay, I feel like God's calling me to speak, or I feel like I'm supposed to be doing more with this communication thing. It was very scary. You know, it was very closed industry. People weren't talking, you know, you couldn't just call up your local Christian speaker and say, Hey, you know, how do you hop on a stage without like busting into tears? Cause you're terrified. <laughs> you know, there, there was nobody to talk to about these mm-hmm. things. And so I, I recall all of that, the loneliness, the feeling like, I feel like God's called me to something, but I have no barometer or no map or compass or anything to tell me even what's next and how to maneuver these different parts. Mm -hmm. And so um, over the past few years, I just had a whole lot of different opportunities. And I remember just one time, you know, within the past couple of years, sitting with God and thinking and saying actually out loud, it's like, God, what am I, I feel so blessed. How am I, what am I supposed to be doing with this? I don't feel like you get blessed just for yourself to be blessed. Um, You know, so many opportunities, so many chances to, to, to just help other women. And I feel like that's really what he spoke to my heart, you know, create the space you wish you had 10 years ago, mm-hmm. create the place where you can mentor women, not just mentor them with your words, but you know, one of the opportunities I offer in my mastermind is the actual one-on-one direct shadowing. Like they come into the space with me into these large arenas where I'm speaking, you know, and they're, they're with me when I'm talking to other celebrity type speakers. I don't consider myself one, but there are quite a few that everybody knows. So they're yeah. standing there with me when they see us having conversation, they get introduced to the event planners, they get opportunities to be able to practice their talk in community with other women, we pray together, we cry together, you know, this, <laughs> this past weekend, we had our monthly gathering where um, different people within the group have opportunities to share their material so that they can test it out, so to speak, on other pe- people, people. So it's it's just a training ground for the women God's raising up in this place of communication. Oh, I, I love that. <laughs> well, congratulations on on all of that. Um, you know, Brooke and I, we have the same heart for helping to empower and support women. We're at the very beginnings of creating our own collective of sorts, our joy prescription. We see it as a wellness community and a support network for Christian women leaders in the field of ministry, fields of ministry and medicine. And, and just like you, it's it's me saying, you know, God, you know, you've given me so much, you know, how can I just give back and in some small way to be for other women what I wished I had? I'm not nearly as far on the journey as you are, but uh, certainly I think we, we all need this uh, support and connection. So it's really wonderful what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. Very inspiring. Well, Dr. Sandra, I have some questions um, related to sacred rest. Rest itself seems like this simple process, but 
we know so many people struggle with fatigue and insomnia. Can you speak to why that is? Yeah, I think too often we put all of our focus on sleeping and sleep is important, obviously, but I think what the point that we miss is that there's a transition that has to occur from our day hours to our sleeping hours. And for me, what I feel like that transition, that bridge that we're missing is rest. So we try to take our stressed out, you know, exhausted bodies, tell them to flick the switch and go to bed. And it's like, you know, you're still in mental unrest or your senses are still over agitated. You, you haven't actually crossed the bridge of rest to actually get to deeper, higher quality sleep. And so I feel like that adds to the amount of people who are suffering with, with, ongoing insomnia. And as well as those who say that, you know, they have chronic fatigue, I don't doubt that they are tired, but I mm -hmm. think the disconnect is they are, haven't identified what kind of tired they actually are. So they say I'm tired and in their head, they're thinking, okay, I'm tired. I just need to lay down or stop something or take a break. But rest is more than just cessation. It's more than just stopping it's about restoration. It's about pouring back into the places that have become depleted. And mm -hmm. I, and I fear we've become more associated with this, the cessation activities of rest and not the restorative components and activities uh, required for us to be able to rest. Mm -hmm. So important. <laughs> yeah. That's a great distinction. Yeah. I I've been tracking my own sleep with this aura ring for mm -hmm. several years now, and it's really given me some deep insights you know, I'm typically in the bed, you know, eight and a half hours per night, but uh, clearly need to extend that. You know, what I've learned is that the time asleep usually is like 45 minutes less than the time I'm in bed. And, and I'm typically a good sleeper. And it's just giving me a lot of insights into things that I do during the day, like, you know, late time eating and, you know, exercising at night or, you know, watching a, you know, some disturbing news or something like that, mm -hmm. it will be reflected in my sleep score. So I, yeah. I totally agree with you. It's not, it's not just sleep. It's how we conduct our day and how we're preparing our bodies to rest. So thanks for sharing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And can you define, um, or like the distinction between sleep and rest for our listeners? Um, cause like you spoke to earlier, a lot of people think, oh, I just need more sleep when I'm tired. But for those who may be a brand new concept that, oh, sleep and rest are different. How do you define the distinction? Yeah. So sleep is a type of rest. Um, it falls under the physical rest component, but um, probably the easiest way to, to describe that is if we think about the seven different types of rest that I discuss in sacred rest, they include physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, social, sensory, and creative. And so of that, those seven, sleep falls in the physical rest component. However, physical rest has a passive component, which is sleeping and napping. Then it also has an active component, which includes those things like stretching or taking a leisure walk or using a foam roller or getting massage or those kind mm, of things. My favorite. <laughs> <Stop. Yeah. laughs> so, you know, if you think, if you put all of your fatigue eggs, so to speak, in the sleep basket, you've not only kind of completely gotten rid of the other six types of rest, you're not even getting all of the type of physical rest. So you're getting like this tiny portion of the rest you could be experiencing. Wow. Yeah, awesome. Yes. So much potential there. Untapped potential. <laughs> yeah. I definitely am a believer in physical rest, but your chapter on mental rest, that one, that one spoke to me <laughs> and knowing, knowing me, that's no surprise. I have a very busy, creative, expansive, problem solving, kind of optimizing brain. And, and that's, as you mentioned in the book, not uncommon for women who are called to academic pursuits or ministry medicine. And um, I love your reference to Romans 8, 6, and that the mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Mm -hmm. And then you, you direct the readers to create a mental sanctuary where our minds can go to retreat from the chaos of our day and, and to a place of order and peace and and I just love um, 
the idea of picking a characteristic of God, like one of the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, and then um, just choosing to focus on that quality for a day. And, and so you inspired me this morning on a Monday morning with a jam-packed schedule. I, I chose peace today. So thank you, Sandra, for that. <laughs> Yeah, that's one I use often. I, I sometimes mm -hmm. call it my mental word cheer whenever my mind starts to wander off into wherever it wants to go, whatever anxieties or thoughts that I seed it into that word for the day. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I love doing that because I think it does help us not get in the kind of in the um, on the roller coaster ride of emotions that can yeah. occur when you just mm -hmm. let your thoughts go wherever they want to. Mm hmm. Absolutely. Well, Dr. Sandra, I've heard it said before, and I'll admit, I think it may have slipped out of my own mouth uh, once or twice before in the past, but this uh, idea of, oh, I'll have time to rest when I get to heaven and just kind of being dismissive of, of rest altogether and just having this mentality of I've got to keep grinding now, I have no time to waste but in fact, rest is not inherently wasteful. So I would love for you to enlighten us to better understand what the long-term effects are of focusing only on work and neglecting regular periods of rest. Yeah, I think, you know, for, for a lot of us, we don't have a respect for rest. That's what it boils down to. <laughs> we have a lot of respect for the work, for producing, for something where we can tangibly see the results kind of right in front of us, check it off the box kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And so we get into a position where we feel like because rest isn't something we can necessarily kind of easily check off our box, that it must not be as valuable. We can't see a, a specific fruit resulting that we've produced. And, you know, I sometimes kind of relate it back to if you think about like a bumblebee uh, or a honeybee rather, but they're busy in their hive, they're making all this honey, they're doing all this stuff, they're getting a lot produced, they're doing a lot of work. However, everybody else around them is enjoying the fruit of their labor. And mm -hmm. so they're so busy producing goodness for everyone else, but they never actually stop long enough to taste the sweetness of their own life. And I think that that's where many women find themselves, you know, they're making life great for their kids and their husband and their house and everybody else is all happy, happy, happy. And mom's like the honeybee. She's busy making everybody's life sweet, but hers is pretty bitter. And so I think we have to realize that there, there's a, a need to regain our respect for rest. It's countercultural. Our culture doesn't promote that. You know, so it takes a woman who has a little bit of boldness and courage to, to understand that to be the best version of herself requires sometimes that she allow space in, in her life to actually be restored. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that it's a mindset shift. It takes, it takes some time and some re-education, so to speak. But I think once somebody tastes the well-rested life is how I describe it, it's mm -hmm. hard to go back to just buzzing around with activity. You're like, you know, this life it does have sweet moments and I need to have a, a kind of pull away for a moment to have those come away moments where I am enjoying the blessings around me. Yeah, that is so true. I feel like I've, I've journeyed through that as well. Like once you've tasted how life can be different and how you can prioritize different, differently and how you can, um, refill your cup. <laughs> Cindy's taught me a lot about that, about not giving out of an empty cup and um, filling each other's cup in our family life, um, that you do see it is possible, change is possible, some a different way is possible, and you don't want to go back to that place of burnout. Yeah. Well, Sandra, I, you mentioned the seven types of rest, and I know it's a huge topic, but I'm sure you're able to give us kind of some bullet points around the different types and just how you define them and, and maybe a little hint on pointing us toward uh, getting rest in each of those areas. Yeah. So we talked about physical and a little bit about mental. Mental really just boils down to being able to clear your head space, as you mentioned, getting your, your head kind of to that quiet spot. Um, and you shared one of your activities um, as far as the, uh, spiritual rest, I would probably say the biggest disconnect people have with that one is that it's not simply about just having religious activities that are in your life, but it's really about relationship. 
and making sure that you're making space in your life to listen and to have time apart with God, where you're not always the one putting demands and, and questioning and having all your, you know, your prayer requests and all of these things that you're just presenting, but you're actually spending time just in the presence of God and just enjoying the relationship that comes from spending time. And that's a big part of the spiritual rest. Um, with emotional rest, it deals with being authentic about your feelings, having opportunities where you are in relationship with other people where you don't feel the need to keep your emotions kind of under check. You can say what you feel without fear of, of retaliation or without fear of someone kind of you know get, looking at you funny. You can just say it like it is if you're depressed, if you're anxious, if whatever. And so mm-hmm. emotional rest requires you to take a look at the people in your life and see if there is someone who you feel open enough to be, have that level of transparency. And if not, maybe it needs to be a counselor or a therapist or a pastor or, or whoever you need to be able to release that. But failure to release it can become very toxic. A lot of us have quite a bit of emotional labor that we hold on to, and we aren't aware of the amount of emotional unrest that we're experiencing. I know for myself, this was the area that I was actually needing. It was what was burning me out. Mm -hmm. Um, As a physician, there's a lot of professional emotional labor that goes with the job. You know, you're in the ICU with the patient and they're dying. In my town, we are small towns. So I, these aren't strangers in my ICU. These are like family members almost. I know, you know, I know their kids. I've seen the dog. Um, And so when they're in an end of life situation, my emotions may want to cry but I'm never going to cry in an ICU. I'm surrounded by my nursing staff. I, I, I got to be the professional. I have to keep it together. Mm-hmm. And so there has to be a, t- so we have to recognize first when we have those moments, when we are at war with our natural emotions and we keep them at bay and make sure that we then have opportunities for those emotions to be released in safe places. Mm-hmm. Um, social rest deals with the people in our life and it re- requires us to take a look at who are the relationships that are pulling from us socially? You and they're negatively kind of draining our social energy. Usually those are people that we care about and love, you know, it could be your kids, your spouse, uh, elderly parents, it might be your clients or your coworkers. And then we have to think about who are the people in our life who don't need anything from us. They're life-giving. They're actually pouring back into us socially because most of us spend the majority of our time with the people who are negatively pulling from our social energy because they're more demanding. And hardly any time with the people who are actually life-giving and pouring back into it. And so to make sure that we make room in our lives for those people who are socially restful to us. Um, Mm -hmm. Creative rest deals with the opportunities to allow beauty in whatever form, whether that's natural or man-made beauty, to inspire and to kind of revive our creative parts of ourselves. And so many of us don't think of ourselves naturally as creatives. However, creative energy is used whenever we problem solve or whenever we're having to think yes. outside of the box or be innovative. And so we use quite a bit of, of creative energy and typically don't have an outlet for pouring back into that area of ourselves. So it can easily become depleted. And so you have to think about what are the things that inspire you? Maybe it's images of the ocean. Maybe it's listening to music, maybe it's being out in nature. So whatever those creative elements and things that actually pour back into you, making space in your life or creating opportunities to engage with those. And then finally is sensory rest. Sensory rest deals with evaluating your sensory inputs and thinking about how the effect that they have on you. So the lights, the sounds, you know, from our electronics to the background noises where we work, being aware that even when we try to tune things out, that our brain has to process them for them to be able to be tuned out. Mm. So a part of yourself is being used, even if you're not consciously aware of it. Mm, And most of us, when we become sensory overwhelmed, our response is usually irritation, agitation, rage, or anger. Mm. And so (laughs) you're you're like, like, why am I so agitated? You know, you're thinking, you know, I don't know why I'm so mean when I get, because I know for myself, I would come home you know, from working at the hospital, I'm like, well, my kids would say, what's for dinner? And I would like snap people's head off yeah. <laughs> over the dinner question. And I was like, you know what? I'm hearing, I'm hearing the hum of ventilators. I'm hearing like these mm-hmm. lights that make a sound that no one seems to hear, but me, you know, I'm hearing <laughs> all of these things in my atmosphere and they were affecting me. So mm-hmm. a simple way that I started to downgrade my sensory input on the way home is rather than listening to 
you know, an audio book or, you know, something that I would normally do. I just drove home in silence from the hospital. Mm -hmm. I needed like just a moment of quiet just to kind of reset my system before I walked into my home. Oh, yes, I so I experienced brilliant. the sensory overload with mommy, mom, mom. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. It's like let's batch our questions. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but thank yes. you, such such wisdom, and I love the the life giving friends, and mm-hmm. I'm I'm very blessed to have have mm-hmm. many in my life, and mm-hmm. oh, thank you. I, I love the way your mind works, Sandra. Just super organized and methodical and and being able to detail out these different kinds of rest. It's very insightful. It is. Yeah. I was even thinking as you were speaking, I love that you spoke to the create the creative rest and how creativity is not just artistic, um, but problem solving and how I have, I feel like I've spoken to so many friends and, and Uh, people in my congregation as a pastor and speaking that life into people when I hear so many people and especially women, oh, I'm just not creative. I'm just not creative. And they think creative is associated with crafty. It's like, that's not, that's two different things. Uh, Crafty is creative, but there's whole different other beautiful creative gifts. And um, so I love that you are exposing that and, and allowing people to um, tap into their creativity. And I know I find rest sometimes like create creative rest through just organizing, organizing a junk drawer, organizing a closet. It just like brings such calm and (laughs) peace to me. And I've had people, "I, I want you to come to my house and organize and I'll pay you to organize. I'm like, I don't want to be paid to organize. That's my, that's my outlet, (laughs) my stress release, you know, to, to do that. Um, And then when you were talking about spiritual rest, and I was just thinking about, you know, the idea of Jesus as our Sabbath rest and learning how to rest in him. um, That has been a big life journey for myself, being a very performance driven overachiever type Um, learning that I've heard it phrased this way from uh, a minister before that it's not about our performance, but Jesus's performance. And the most important work that will ever be accomplished in all of time and eternity has already been done through Jesus. And so us being able to learn how to rest in his care, rest in his provision, learning to trust him, uh, that he's going to take care of his sheep because he's the good shepherd. That's been a, a journey for me in learning how to um, to rest in Him, and and I think it'll be an ongoing life journey to continue to get deeper mm-hmm. <laughs> understanding and revelation of that. But I'm sure that's been a part of your journey as well, seeing Jesus as the Sabbath rest in your life. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as I mentioned, the second half of the book, I start off with discussing just you know even how He rested. Because mm-hmm. I think it's important True. to see that rest wasn't, you know, it was in the beginning, obviously. Right. <laughs> um, started with Genesis, was in the beginning. Yeah. But it, it was something that Jesus valued enough that he he regularly did these rest restful things that I don't think most of us caught because we, we weren't really thinking about that. We were thinking about at 33, he went into his ministry and mm-hmm. we see the doing because that's where our natural minds get drawn to the doing of what he did, but we don't always kind of appreciate the resting he did to do the doing. And because mm-hmm. he was still a, all what full man as well as fully God. So he had to still abide by the, the things that we as, as humankind need to be able to function. And so it was just really beautiful just to have that opportunity to kind of look at the gospels in a new way. And yeah. start seeing, you know, how did Jesus live this out in a very full and, you know, powerful life? Yeah, so true. Like the sensory overload, the crowds coming after him. Okay, time to go to the mountaintop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, one of my favorite ones is, is when, you know, there's all of these people that needed to be healing. And it's like, he's, he's like, okay, that's enough. We're, we're taking a break now. Mm-hmm. How many of us would have kept going? Right. Mm-hmm. And feeling there obligated. Was work, there was, mm-hmm. there's work to be done. I mean, I hear so many people say, you know, I'll rest when the work is over. The rest 
the work is never over. There's always That's something right. you can right. be doing. But I think I'd love that example because it was like, you know, I know that there are people who still need me, but I know me and mm-hmm. I need to withdraw to a desolate place at this time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And model that for his disciples who were going to be carrying on the work. And so it's still a valid example for us today when we need to, to heed. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Sandra, I love all the teaching vignettes in, in your book, The Sacred Rest, and in particular, the story of Hannah. I could relate to your situation with her, the um, the new patient that was referred from a friend of yours, and she was sitting with her arms crossed and her legs crossed, and I think she, she opened up the conversation of, if you mention Jesus, I'm leaving. <laughs> and, you know, so her body language was, you know, showing that she was guarded. And you mentioned that, of course, you know, you put it on the internet, you know, you're very open about your faith. And so she, she knew that coming in. And I find that it's, it's interesting because I, I seem to draw people <laughs> that um, maybe that might be down be be hungering for some sort of spiritual connection. And, and they sense that about me from what I put out there in the world, but, but yet there's this um, kind of resistance to it. And I just wanted to, to have a little bit of a discussion about, you know, with you, you mentioned your professors uh, in medicine warning against mixing faith and medical science. And, and uh, you know, I've heard that same <laughs> admonition as well. And, and just wanted to uh, get your, get your thoughts on, on that encounter. Yeah. You know, I, I purposely put that in there, obviously, but when I put it in there, I put it in there because a part of me knew that somebody who needed the book would not be in agreement with my faith. Although mm-hmm. I specifically wrote the book for Christians and titled it sacred, you know, <laughs> right. it's labeled as Christian <laughs> nonfiction. I knew that some, and I didn't, obviously I didn't know it was going to do all it did, but I knew some people who were not of faith wouldn't be needing this book. And so I wanted them to recognize, I see you, I I get Mm -hmm. it. I get it. You're not ready to, you, you don't, you don't want my religion. I get it. But can we have a conversation where I respect you and you respect me? You know, (laughs) it's one of those things where take, you know, and I start the book off by saying, in the very first, how to use this book, you know, um, it's like a buffet. If you go to buffet and you're keto, you don't eat the donuts, you know, but it's still a buffet. (laughs) Nobody gets down to the buffet because they had donuts on it. You get to do you at wherever you're at in your journey. And you choose the parts of the buffet that are feeding you and the parts that feel like something you can't consume right now, then you leave it for or whenever you want to go back, you know, the buffet mm-hmm. doesn't close. So it's one of those things where I wanted people to recognize, even if we don't agree on that component of it, you can still benefit from this journey. Yeah. God will meet well, you where you're at in your rest journey, whether you believe in him or not, he's going to meet yeah. you where you're at <laughs> in your rest journey. And so I wanted people just to kind of get that out of their mind as being a barrier to the conversation. Mm-hmm. Well, I commend you in just doing a, a beautiful job of showing up fully yeah. and, you know, very direct communication unapologetically, but also just gently encouraging people to mm-hmm. not get hung up on that, you know, the religion piece, but. And they still do. Be, yeah. They still do. You, go, you know, if you go to my Amazon reviews, it's everything mm-hmm. from, you know, it's over a thousand reviews, everything from five stars to it's the best book ever to one stars, way too much Jesus talk, oh, you know, and I, I and so, <laughs> so it's one of those things where you can't make everybody happy. It's one of those yeah, things where sure. you make, you, you do what you feel God told you to do. Let That's him be happy, happy and let him work out the details of it. <laughs> oh, that is a brilliant tip for some emotional rest right there. <laughs> Just do what God told you to do and don't worry about man's opinion. <laughs> Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we'll go ahead and, and wrap up here, but I, I'd love for you to just end on a, a really practical note for all of us today. Like I mentioned, is Monday. <laughs> Many of us have jam-packed schedules. Um, can you give us some quick tips on ways that we can add rest in the middle of a busy workday? 
Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things I would probably say is don't think about rest as stopping. So some people get mental rest when they are doing like physical activity, like mm-hmm. actually going for a jog or, or doing some lifting at the gym. It may seem counter counter restful. Like how is that rest? But sometimes those r- rhythmic type activities, you know, you mentioned even organizing, but some mm-hmm. of those kind of ritualistic rhythmic activities can be mentally restful because it actually focuses your attention down to one or two things. You're not thinking all the thoughts you've directed your thoughts. You know, in the case of jogging, you're, you're thinking specifically about your breathing and your cadence. And so start thinking about mindfulness practices in a new way. We sometimes kind of think of it as new agey mm-hmm. and really it's just focusing your attention kind of in a way that you're able to clear your mental space. I think that is the type of rest most people most are in need of is mental rest. And so everything from the word chair we mentioned to, you know, building your mental sanctuary to finding ways to be, practice meditative practices that feel, you know, organic to you. Beautiful. I love it. Well, share uh, with our listeners how they can connect with you and and learn about all the things that you're doing. Well, the easiest way would probably just be on my main website at ichoosemybestlife.com. They can learn about my podcast there by the same name. And they can always take the rest quiz that you mentioned at simply restquiz.com, just very simple. Um, They get an assessment that lets them know which of the seven types of rest they're most deficient in. And then they can focus their attention on the type of rest or the types of rest they need most. Super. Thank you so much for generously sharing your time today with us, Sandra. We really appreciate it. Yes. It was wonderful connecting with you. And I I might need to get a little t-shirt made that says respect rest (laughs) after this conversation. (laughs) I love it. Thanks so much for having me. Take care. Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.